as modeling. And, uh, and the company have worked many, many years as an entrepreneur driving from idea to product. So we will take you through the presentation today. First of all, safety is of utmost importance for uh, Sandvik. So you can see you have the emergency exit up in that corner in case these doors are blocked. And also, if you need the heart starter, there is at the entrance building uh, where in the other building you find in the entrance there, you can find a heart starter. And if something happens, you dial 112 in Sweden. Thank you for that. And uh, we also care about psychological safety. So there is no, how to say, all questions are equally important. There are no down questions. So just feel free to ask every question you would like to ask. And with this, I would like to start. And uh, let's see here if I can see the, the slides. So, uh, so in Sandvik, we have uh, four long-term sustainability goals that are, circle, that are around circularity, climate, people, and fair play. And this is to guide our different businesses until 2030. And our aim is to lead this shift in industry and be the innovative business partner for our customers by making sustainability part of every day, uh, every aspect of business delivering value for everyone. And Samvik also delivers value all along the value chain meaning that we will also put the same demands on our customers and suppliers as we put on ourselves. Uh, we also work together with customers uh, to integrate sustainability into our business and offering, and you will see some examples of that uh, later on in my presentation. Um, we we'll wait a little bit with the movie. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I would just like to ask you all here in the audience, how many of you would like to have a hybrid or an electrical car? How many of you have a dishwasher? Good. And uh, it's actually, uh, you can start the movie without sound. Uh, you can actually, it's our way of living here in Europe that makes us consume 20% of the raw material produced in the world, while we only produce 2% ourselves. And now I beg your pardon, but the quality of the movie is taken by myself down in a mine, trying a rock drill bit. And just so that you can get an imagination what rock drilling is all about, please turn on the sound. <laughs> in these discussions. Uh, we make mining equipment. We don't do mines, but we make mining equipment. And Sweden is world leading in mining equipment, actually. So uh, if you can turn on the movies for me. So here you can also see to the left, you see machining. Because also if you uh, have, uh, first let's start with the right one. There you can see a high speed camera of a rock drilling operation. And if you look carefully, you can see when the blow comes, the, uh, the drill is actually standing still. To the left, you see a high speed uh, camera movie of a machining operation. When we make cars and airplanes, uh, you need machining. Uh, in production, almost 70% of everything that's manufactured is machined. You can see the smoke coming out. The material has to last at least two gigapascals and between 800 and 1000 degrees C. And for rock drilling, also around two gigapascals and around 800 degrees as operating temperature in the hottest spot. 
what is this material that can last this? This material is cemented carbide or hard metal. I will use both words. And it consists of, oh, it consists of tungsten carbide, which is the squared grains here, and the binder in between, which is the cobalt metal. And this is just a little bit images for those who are into it. And if you look at the scale here, the tungsten carbide grain is, you have 100 nanometers here. So the cobalt pockets are really of nanometer size and the tungsten carbide grains are around from 0.6 millimeters, uh, 0.6 micrometers up to approximately two micrometers uh, in grain size. And uh, what, how can neutrons then help contribute to this? Oh, it was, didn't say so. To this development. And I can tell you that because neutrons, they can provide us with non-destructive methods to investigate the material. Uh, they can also give us real-time processing insights. Uh, they, the transmission in uh, hard metal, cemented carbides, you need neutrons, but cemented carbide is a very heavy material. Tungsten is usually used as production sheets for x-rays, and here we have tungsten carbide, so you need neutrons to get penetration depth. <coughs> and of course we can have real-time studies, and here you can see uh, just an in-situ experiments where we are looking at uh, what is happening at operating temperature with a cemented carbide or hard metal. Here you can see the uh, results of the experiment where the most important parameter in the tungsten carbide is the tungsten carbide in the hard metal is the tungsten carbide grain size and the cobalt binder pocket. And here you can see how the tungsten carbide uh, grain size gets smaller and smaller due to a polluting element within uh, the cemented carbide, a polluting or a deliberately added uh, element. You also realize, looking at these pictures, that there is a lot also <coughs> a lot of interfaces between the tungsten carbide grains and the cobalt binder and between tungsten carbide grains and tungsten carbide grains. And we have, you have worked for many years with modeling these interfaces and developed something called interfacial phase diagrams where we combined thermodynamics with ab initio calculations to calculate the properties of the interface between the semantic carbide and the cobalt and the semantic carbide and semantic carbide. Uh, grains between two semantic carbide grains. And this is a collaboration between industry and academia, between KTH and theoretical physics at Chalmers and Sandvik in this case. And here you can see an example of this, where we have tailored in this case the interface between the tungsten carbide and the cobalt. He oh, I'm, I'm not so good at this. Uh, here with a very, very thin layer of titanium tungsten carbide at the interface that gives us totally different properties of our material. And in this case, I should say that it's patented, so you can look at it. <laughs> but what can this give then in performance? Well, it can give you a lot in performance. Here you can see the difference in performance, both when it comes to how often you need to regrind your drill bit in this case, and in the bit life. And which means that these interfacial layers in this case are increasing the bit life with 100%. And you also get more grinding intervals. And this, of course, means that you can excavate more rock using less material. But what it also means is that uh, when you are drilling in the mine, the most dangerous place in the mine is in front of the drill rig when you need to go and exchange the drills. This has so far been the most difficult part to automize in the mine, and it's still not fully automized. So, by prolonging the bit life, you also make a safer choice. You contribute to the safety in the mine. So if you imagine a small mine having five tunneling jumbos, 
drilling machines, it means by prolonging the bit life uh, as done here, then you can actually reduce the number of hazards that you have to put the person to when you change the drill bit with more than 10,000 10, times a year. And this is something maybe not so many think about, but it's a very important outcome <laughs> of an improved productivity in uh, the mining business. I would also, in this work, I would like to thank you, all the collaborators in here. And for me, I'm a little bit surprised over this difficulty in collaboration in industry and academia, because it's been part of my world for more than 20 years. <laughs> and I just think it's fun if you do it the right way. And uh, in this case, it's uh, Katie Chalmers, the competence center here at M2I for all the modeling, materials modeling, the Swedish Neutron School and the SSF Sintering project. And I just put up some of the patents that has been the outcome of this joint collaboration. And the fastest from idea to product was uh, three years. And the longest from idea to product was 14 years. And the difference is that in the one with 14 years is that in that case, we could not use existing production methods. As soon as you need to go in and build new production methods, the time from idea to product increases. So this is something to, I think that we should take with us in these discussions. Then we come to recycling. And here you can see the obvious reason why we need to recycle. Thanks to Nor or Shaelite, as you see here to the, uh, in the picture, it only contains about 0.5% of tungsten. While our finished products contains more than 85% of tungsten. So of course, if we can recycle and, and use urban mining as a way to get our resources, uh, it would be great. You can also see here, if you look on the upstream, uh, refining midstream and consumption uh, part, here in the upstream you can see it's mainly Asia. You can see here in the refining and the midstream it's also mainly Asia and some Americas. And then in the consumption is uh, both Asia, Americas and the EU, but much more EU than in the other ones which also then, of course, will make us less dependent of uh, the, the upstream producers if we can recycle our own material. To, uh, in the other graph, you can see a life cycle analysis, how also the carbon dioxide emissions would be reduced if we can go from virgin base to use more recycled material in our products. So why is it important? I've said one part of it, but the Earth has limited uh, commodities to sustain growth, a growing population, and we need to renew renewable resources. I think that's every evident to everyone. We need to reduce the CO2 emissions, and in this case we can do it with 70% if we can recycle. And we can secure supply that's not originate from conflict areas. As you know, cobalt is a metal that comes from conflict areas. So if we can reuse, recycle cobalt, it would be much better. And also in the mining business, it's a little bit special, but then we can also create local business in small mining communities uh, across the world, offering employment in these communities. And now I will just let you see a little bit of a movie of what recycling can do. So enjoy.
Um, just also as a worker or working in this industry, it's quite nice that to know that we can contribute with re reducing the carbon dioxide emissions by recycling our products. Moving on, we should also know that recycling, it sounds easy, but of course it's also drawbacks, and you must be aware of this. And of course, if we start to produce something from uh, scrap material instead of virgin material, it also means that we get pollutions from the scrap materials. And now I want you to reflect back to those interfacial layers you saw. What happens if you get polluting elements into your material? Those interfacial layers that we have struggled so hard to create and make such an improvement in performance. So this is, of course, something that we have started to research about to in large amount. So everywhere we can now, we apply for applications where we can study small amounts of impurities and what do they do to our microstructures and our interfacial layers. Because we, are know, we know that they are crucial for our performance. Another thing not, not said in the movie, but it's of outermost importance also, is the material's ability to be able to, um, to work harden. And that is also something uh, that we have to study what happens when you get polluting elements from the scrap. Or can you tweak the polluting elements so that you can govern them, so you know what is happening and you can steer the system. And here is just one example where we have studied the impact of uh, titanium only as a polluting element. Titanium from inserts used in metal cutting from the coating. So this is a very common polluting element in the scrap. And hopefully, or we can already now, but hopefully even more in the future, we can then use our material again and again. And again. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Susan, for this exciting uh, talk where real recycling uh, is, is, is ongoing. And you go from all the way from the biggest rock drilling power to small, small nanostructures. So, that's, that's nice. A uh, question for, for, for Susan? And we have one more question over here. Are you trying to look for any substitutes? material because then we already have the cobalt and we know the sourcing of the cobalt. Um, what we do in parallel is also to look at alternative binders like uh, iron and nickel binders but also everybody knows on the uncertain times in Europe that the largest nickel plant in the world belongs to Russia. So it's uh, we started but it's um, maybe a little bit going at slower pace at the moment until we know uh, what is happening in the world. 
one final question then. If I remember correctly, correctly, you had uh, vanadium in in uh, in one of your systems. Yes, that was uh, uh, how do you say um, illustration. Uh, vanadium is used as a grain growth inhibitor and is well known as one of the most common grain growth inhibitors in cementic carbides. So, if you get vanadium as a polluting element from your scrap, uh, your tungsten carbide uh, crystallite size will be too small and your properties will not be good for rock drilling. Great that you say that, but actually my question was something different. <laughs> okay. I mean, vanadium is, as a metal, it's not a problem probably, but uh, if vanadium oxidizes, if you form vanadium pentoxide, that could be actually toxic. So Absolutely. So but how do you uh, handle this kind of unusual uh, kind exactly of Exactly, and that is why we don't want it in rock drilling, because then you expose the tungsten carbide to the air. Uh, in metal cutting, it's a different story, because then uh, we want the small grain size of the tungsten carbide grains, so then you can use uh, vanadium. Uh, but, uh, and in that case, the tungsten carbide is covered by a PVD or CVD coating, so you never expose the vanadium to the air, so to say. Yeah, but yeah, it's good. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, but then usually the insert fails too. So <laughs> yeah. Well, then I think we should thank Susanne again for this excellent talk.